Boys, it is our honor and privilege, Baruch Hashem, that we have the Zechut, that a lot of places here don't have to have one of the greatest speakers of, in the Jewish world today, Rabbi Yosef Hazrafi, who has helped so many people to come back to Teshuvah. I'm hearing numbers like in the six figures of numbers of people that got strengthened from the lectures of Acham Yosef Mizrahi Shlita. And uh, we have some sort of zechut today that we get to have the rabbi over here to talk to us, to give us Dibre Chizuk. And Baruch Hashem, we're very, very fortunate. And Bezat uh, Hashem, I hope very, very, very much that we should take these words that the rabbi is going to say to our heart, as many, many, many other Jews have done in the past and have changed and become better and are much happier in their lives now. And uh, whatever questions we may have any doubts in the religion or in, well, however the religion works and everything, now's the time to ask because the rabbi has all the answers to all these questions. And without any further ado, let us listen very clearly to the words of Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi Shlita Bechabod. Thank you very much, Rabbi. It's always a, a great honor and pleasure to come to Lev Aaron Yeshiva here in Yerushalayim and to speak. I've done it a few times in the past. And Baruch Hashem, many of the students that were here, many of them were very affected and he gave them the right direction in life. Obviously, when young boys like you leave uh, America and come here to sit and learn Torah, it's already a great step to the right direction. As the Torah said, that Hashem said to every Jew, Ptach li petach kepitcho shel machat, veftach lecha kepitcho shel ulam. Open me a hole size of a needle. Just make the first step. And I will open you a very wide size of a hole, you know, large place. Meaning, if you make the first step to the right direction, then obviously you're going to see how I will open for you more and more opportunities. So when someone decides to leave whatever he does in uh, New York or anywhere else, and just come here and see it, and growing Torah in Yirat Shamayim, it's already a huge step forward and it makes great impression in Shamayim. However, we all know that the first step is not enough. The question is, where are we heading? Where is the final destination? So we should know that the, the Gemara, the Chachamim says that Bederech Shadam Molichim Oto. There's a rule in life. Uh, one person decides to be lo alen, wicked, rasha, to do horrible things, to behave like an animal. Who, hel who helps him to achieve his goals? Believe it or not, but it's Hashem. Bederech she'adam rotze lilech molichim oto. One decides to be a thief. Hashem directs him to people that needs to lose money, to steal from them. One decides to be a murderer. Hashem sends him to someone that's supposed to die. One decides to do all the horrible things, Hashem makes zivugim. The Gemara said that one Roman matronita, the Romans were here, they, you know, they occupied Israel, they were the police, they were the army, they had a lot of fancy people here while, while we were under their control. She asked the Chachamim, since Hashem created the world, what is he doing since then? So he told her, since then, Hashem is mezavek zivugim. He's a matchmaker. So she said, matchmaker? Well, I have a thousand, a thousand slaves and a thousand female slaves. Come back next week, you see how I match all of them. After a week, one guy was missing an eye, one woman without a head. <laughs> they kill each other. She said, oh, I didn't know it's so hard to be a matchmaker. Even today, 
Do you know how hard it is to match a boy to a girl? You know how many things you have to consider and to investigate and to check and to remember? And hopefully it will work. And you need special si'ata dishmaya in it. Some people, as much as they try, they cannot close one shiduch. And some people, it looks like they have no idea what they do, and they do good shiduchim eventually. Because in the end, it's Hashem. The question is, is this your job or not your job? If it's your job, you have siyata dishmaya. If it's not your job, you try it five, six times, you realize it's not for me, you move on. But many people don't understand the answers of the Chachamim to this woman lady, Hashem is a zivugim, it's not only husband and wife. That's a part of the matchmaking. It's between partners, it's between neighbors, it's between many, many things. Rabbi and a student, two chevrutas in yeshiva. Every year Hashem mezavek zivugim. So when finally a person decides I'm leaving everything and I come to Lev Aaron, so many boys came here in not such a high level. But after a year or two that we were here, there's nothing to compare how they arrived and how they moved on with their life. Some of them have mamash wonderful families. Sometimes in Brooklyn, Syrian boys stop me in Flatbush. Bnei Torah, remember me? You came to Levaron, you gave a lecture, I was on my way to the wrong direction, and look what I became now. That gives you a lot of inspiration. But no one will do the job for you. Rabbi Laniado and all the other wonderful rabbis here, they will put their heart and efforts to do the right thing. But it's not in their hand. I will do everything I can to help, but it's not in my hand. In the end, im en anili mili. If I don't take care of my soul, no one will. Hashem will send the right people to help. But if a person doesn't want to receive help, how is it going to help? So first of all, a person has to remember what I just say. I am here to open for Hashem to throw as much as blessing on my life. A person that sits and learns Torah seriously, that is here to learn, not to walk around in the streets of Jerusalem, seriously, wakes up from Shachrit, sits all day and learn, in an average day he can make 600,000 mitzvot. Like the Chafetz Chaim did the calculation, one hour of Torah, in every minute a person say 200 words, every word ha have an average five letters, that's a thousand letters per minute, which each letter is like putting tefillin on. You know when you put tefillin on, it's mitzvah from the Torah. On the hand, one mitzvah. The head, two mitzvot. Every morning, two mitzvot. Talit, three mitzvot d'oraita. It takes you five minutes. Three mitzvot d'oraita takes five minutes to put talit, to put the hand, to put the head. Three minutes, let's say. Three minutes, a, mi a, minute, a minute per mitzvah, the oraita. In one minute, 1,000 mitzvot of Torah. If people would understand the value of Torah, they would never miss a, a minute a day from the minute they arrive here until the minute one day they go and get married. They would not miss them a minute. Because if you know you make a million dollar a minute, would you sit outside for 15 minutes and waste time? Obviously not. Problems with us, some more, some less, that they still do not understand the value of the Torah. And the bigger problem is that by the time people will understand the value of the Torah, maybe already too late for them. Maybe by then they'll be old, their brain will not be as sharp as now in your 20s. Maybe they will be married with lots of children and lots of Parnassa issues. They don't have a peace of mind to learn. These days will not return. Even if you stay a learner for the rest of your life, you will still miss the years that you were 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, all these precious years that people will busy, were busy with lots of nonsense and these years will not return. This is the years you establish yourself, you build yourself up. Plus, we know the Gemara in Masechet Sota, Amud Bet, the Gemara say that Mezavgim lo la'adam zivug lefi ma'asav. Amar ish lakish, mezavgim lo la'adam zivug lefi ma'asav. When a person is bar mitzvah, 
has about seven years in average until he will get married. Seven, eight years, you know. These years basically are the most important in his entire life because a wife can build a house or chas v'shalom can destroy a house. Isha bona, isha oreset. If he gets a kosher madis, great, uh, inspiring wife with irat shamayim that pushes him always to the right direction, calm him down when he needs to be calm. And, you know, she's keep pushing and she's a great mother to the children. 20, 30 years later, he's now in his 50s, he's starting to have grandkids. His family is a beautiful, holy tribe. The wife is the reason for all of it. What got him such a wife? The ears right here, right? You see? You look around here, look at the tables, look at the Gemarot, Sifre Musar, the rabbis around you. Right now you build your entire life, but not just your life. You build your eternity. Because remember, the purpose of this whole life is to go to the place when the Neshama will be in the upper world, which is eternal, in the highest level of spiritual pleasure. Just like the Gemara says in Pirkei Avot, Yafa sha'a achat shel korat ruach ba'olam haba'a mikol chaye ha'olam haze. One hour of what's going to happen to your soul in the afterlife is greater than this entire world. Not your world. The world of all the people combined from Adam until the end of days. Multiply billions of people, 78 years of life, full of any pleasure you can imagine, make a huge pile of pleasure, endless pile from here to the sun, will not be equal to one hour of the pleasure that the soul of every righteous Jew is going to have in the next world, and that's for eternity. So imagine, one hour is greater than any pleasure you have. You come here sometimes to Yerushalayim, you go here, you go there, you go to places that are not always kosher. When people ask you why you go there, come on, Rabbi, I have to also, I want to make fun, I want to have fun, the American answer. I want to have fun, I mean, I'm learning, I'm steiging, I'm, ben, I'm much better than two months ago, but I need something to feed my Yetzirah. That comes from ignorance, big ignorance. Why? Lack of knowledge is a big enemy. Somebody asks you, what's the biggest danger in your life? The answer is borut, ignorance. Because when you do not know certain things, you may act not knowing what you are doing and what's the consequences of your action. By the time you'll find out, it will be me'uvat lo yuchal It will be too late to fix. One example it is, you sit here and you're not serious. Eh, what do I care, I, I'm having fun. And then when the time comes for you to get married, what kind of a great high level girl would like you? You're half a learner, half a clown. That's what you're gonna get, a girl that is half religious, half a clown. And girls like this is a big destruction in life. So if it won't end in divorce, it will end in a horrible marriage, which will be a nightmare every day for the next 20, 30 years from the minute you st stand under the chuppah. And then the children will be half a clowns as well. And they will hit your heart. And you're gonna have to beg them to wake up at 11 for shachrit, three hours after the end of Kriyat Shema. And they won't learn, and they won't care, and they will have this terrible, impure device. They will eat your heart from morning to night, and then you're gonna come to the rabbi when your hair is white, and say, ah, my life is a nightmare. I, I, I just hate my life, I can't stand it. And if you had an opportunity then to ask Hashem, why all of that came to me, why? The answer is, remember I brought you to the place, to Bet HaMikdash in Yerushalayim, to sit in front of the holy books, to save your soul, and you neglect, neglected it. You took it for granted, you didn't care. You cared about the, the nonsense out there in the street by the wicked people of Sodom. They attracted you, you imitated them in your haircut, you imitated them in your clothing, you imitated them in a slang, 
in a slang. The Israelis have slangs here. Americans come here, very nice, gentle, with some class. All of a sudden, what? They speak like uh, Arsim. You know what Arsim? <laughs> One of them said, Rabbi, maybe I became an Ars, but I'm an Ars Kadosh. <laughs> That's what Hashem expects from you. If you already arrive to the well, the purpose is to drink. If you already arrived here, grab as much as you can. I promise you from experience. I used to be in your age. These days will not return. Every day is endless in the value. And you will show Hashem you're serious, first of all, the most important thing, it will give you the opportunity to build a beautiful home. Who doesn't want a great wife? Who doesn't want a great, righteous, modest, classy, clean, without social media, without pictures everywhere, without speaking to guys before? Clean, nice girl from a good family. You enjoy every second. You know she's yours and only yours. You know the children will always follow her path. But if you're going to do what I described, you're going to end up regretting it. And then it's not possible to change. Because by then you already locked into a relationship with a woman that she's half a clown. You want to get rid of the clown in you, but it's too late. Because you're married already. What are you going to do? You have a kid or two. You know how many people wants to do tshuva age 25, 27? They got tired of the nonsense. And by now, the girl doesn't let. That's not what I signed for. I'm sorry. I want you to take me to Miami and to Cancun, and I want you to spend time with me in a mall, and let's spend some time in Amazon every day. Oof, you're too fanatic. How much Torah you learn? And listen, I mean, I like the religion, but I didn't want someone so fanatic. <laughs> now you're going to live with handcuffs. Handcuffs on your hands, Handcuffs on your legs and handcuffs on your heart. And believe me, it's a horrible frustration. You know what frustration you're going to have when you're going to be ripped between your future wife to Hashem. You want to come close to Hashem and she doesn't let. Because when you're 21 and you're real serious Baal Tshuva and serious in learning, then Hashem got you a great girl. And she wanted you because she see you dress like a Jew. Your haircut is normal. How much time? I mean, I've had guys in my house for Shabbat with those bloriot, you know. <laughs> I offer them, some of them were broke. Not everyone comes from a rich family. Real broke. They didn't have $30 in a pocket. For the argument's sake, I always like to prove my point that they're willing to die and not to cut their hair off. <laughs> so I say to them, listen, I'm willing to make a deal with you. On Motsi Shabbos, I'll cut off your hair, I'll give you $500. Broke! For him, it's like a year income. <laughs> no, 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 nothing to talk about. I say, listen, $1,000 I give you. What do you care? What, what do you care about the hair? I'm Shomer Shabbos, I'm this, I'm that. No, no, the hair, that's where the sitra achra sits. Sacrifice to Hashem, let's see. You're willing to sacrifice? You know why Avraham Avinu is the most famous person in the world, or in history? Together with David HaMelech and Moshe Rabbeinu, and another 20, 30 people? Top list, VIP, why? Because Abraham Avinu was willing to sacrifice the most important thing in his life that he waited so many years, 75 years he waited for that moment. Finally had a child, finally raised him. Before he even got married, he's willing to slaughter him and give it back to Hashem. With no question asked. That's where Hashem told him, Ata! Yadati ki ere elokim ata. Nine times I tested you before, you jumped into the fire, the world wanted to kill you, you had so many things, you had to left your place. So many inconveniences. None of that made a huge impression on me. But one thing made a great impression on me. You know what? After 75 years I gave you a son, and now I say to you, go and kill him. And you don't even ask why, how come, you contradict yourself, you promise me that he will inherit me, 
you told me to tell the goyim not to kill their kids. Now I'm going to do it. It's going to be big chilul Hashem. So what do we learn from here? You want to impress Hashem? Do it when, it's hurt, when it hurts, like the Chazunish say. If you give tzedakah and it doesn't hurt, it doesn't count. If you have $500 million and you live in a $15 million mansion in Flatbush, and someone knock on the door and you give him $50, that's nothing. You make Hashem's even more upset at you than happy. But if you're a worker in a supermarket and you give $50, that's 10% of your weekly income. It's a very big sacrifice. It hurts. To a billionaire, it doesn't hurt. 50, 100 people. You know those people in Purim? Hundreds of people come, they give each one $100. By the end of Purim, they get $50,000. They make it in an hour. So what's the sacrifice here? You wouldn't give one hour for poor people to have something to eat? You would. You don't feel that you're such uh, righteous people, no? Ah, but the harder it is, the greater the reward and the sacrifices. Lefum tzara agra. The reward is based on the sacrifice and the pain. So the Chazonish say, when you give tzedakah, it has to hurt. So if you're naturally a generous guy, give a lot. Even generous guys, at one point, it hurts. If you're very stingy, give above your ability. Something that will really hurt. Same thing when learning Torah. If you go always to the easy thing to learn, that's not a sacrifice. There's no efforts. If you break your head to understand the hard stuff and you repeat 50 times until you finally got it, that makes a big impression in Shammai. If it's hard for you to wake up in the morning and you decide that's it. From now on I will be one of the first ten in Shachrit. It's no joke. If Chazal says it's a big blessing in life, I'll make it. And then the Satan, of course, is going to come and say to you, come on, uh, Yosef, ah, you don't have to be that fanatic. It's enough you arrive to Shachrit before Az Yashir Moshe. You don't miss the Baruch Hu. And if you're Kohen, you come before Birkat Kohanim, also good, Nezakeh Arabim. <laughs> but if there is a trip now on Ben Azmanim and he has a flight to catch at seven, at four he's up. <laughs> ah, that's when Hashem will get you. Because you're going to have excuses, Hashem, you know how hard it is for me to wake up. In Brooklyn I used to wake up at 11, here I wake up at 8.30, it's a great progress. Aval, when there was a trip, or when there's something you're excited about, you couldn't sleep from the excitement. So why are you telling me it's hard for you to wake up? It's not hard. It just doesn't pay. Because I'm nothing to you. And the Torah is nothing. And the davening is nothing. If you would appreciate the opportunity for davening, you would be the first one there. I have an opportunity to speak to Hashem one hour every day, and I take it for granted. You know, I prayed somewhere in Shabbat. After that filah, they, they, over there they have, uh, the rabbi since COVID doesn't show up anymore. So they took few members of the shul. Every Shabbat, someone else gave a drasha. None of them is a rabbi, but you know, they prepare from certain books about the parasha. This Shabbat, there was one guy that got up on the stand, already angry. So right away from his body language, from the, when they called him, so by the way, he walked with his papers. I said, oh, oh, something is about to happen. I know body language. Seen right away, he's, he's angry about something. So before he started his speech, he criticized the people there. Why? Few people immediately get up and go to the back room. Why? He's going to speak 15 minutes before Musaf. They will return for Musaf. Meaning we, don't, we can care less about your speech. <laughs> they hurt his ego. So he said, this is the first, the last time I give a speech here. To prepare a lecture is a serious all. All means weight, burden for me. I sit, I prepare, and finally I come and people get up and leave. For this kind of disrespect, 
You don't deserve for me to give speeches. So I was thinking to myself about the words of King Solomon, Amesir ozno mishmo atora gam tefilato toeva lo alenu. Translation, someone who comes to pray. He's good in praying. Comes and davens, very good. But when the speaker gets up to speak, immediately he runs out. It's time out for him. Break. Recess. Runs outside. Or if the speech is after Alenu Shabeach, before Alenu Shabeach, quickly he runs out with his children. Terrible example for his children. Why is he running for the children? But when he gets home, he finds that he, his wife didn't even get up. It's 10.30, oh, until she gets up, until she's going to take care of the table. It's going to be 12. What's the rush? Nothing. The reason he runs is only because the Torah means nothing for him. Someone who loves Torah will never miss a speech. Out of curiosity, let's see what he has to say. Even a idiot, even a, someone that is not a Talmud Chacham, can sometimes surprise you with some things you never heard of. So I wanted to tell the guy, after davening, about this Pasuk. That, you know, people that do it, not only they lose the, the Torah, their tefillah is considered abomination in front of Hashem. Because if you don't like my Torah, why should I even listen to your davening? It means that when I say to Moshe Rabbeinu that I have a gift, and that's the most precious thing, Shabbat, Torah, Torah is the most precious thing, and I'm giving it to my children, I would expect that my children, minimum of a minimum, will be very, very excited to know what's in it. In case you're still not convinced, I'll tell you something the Gemara says. Someone wants to marry his daughter. He's a very big businessman, religious. What we call in Israel, datiloni. You know what datiloni means? You know or no? Like some guys in the Knesset with a little quarter on their head, yamaka, tiny, you know? <laughs> so they're half religious, half goyim. That's called datiloni. So, you know, he's a big businessman, he wants to marry his daughter. But business people usually appreciate money more than Torah. So now, he wants someone professional with the potential to make a lot of money, that his daughter will have easy lifestyle. <laughs> so what did he find? A great lawyer or a doctor or, I don't know, engineer, whatever. Someone who is already established. So he's so excited, wow, I got this doctor, I got this lawyer. And all the fools around, shkoyach, shkoyach, zaku baruch, what a chatan, what a great sharp lawyer it is, I know him, I used to work with him in a firm, everyone gives him a tap on his shoulder. Except Hashem. What does the Gemara say about someone like this? Amesi bito le'am ha'aretz. Someone who marries his daughter to someone that is, a, is ignorant in Torah. He yeah, doesn't know Torah. Asking Gemara, he doesn't know. Asking Allah, he doesn't know. Even Musa, he doesn't know. Nothing. It's like tying her to a tree in front of a hungry lion. The lion goes his victim and then rip him apart. Let your daughter marry someone without Torah, that's, what, that's what's going to be her end. And I am the best witness for that. 27 years, thousands of girls are crying, save me, I'm dying. Who told you to marry such a person without Torah? It's like a hungry lion. <laughs> it's a disaster. <coughs> Today, more than ever. Back 30 years ago, people had manners. Even secular schools taught some kind of manners. Today it became a zoo, officially a zoo. The teachers, the teachers, excuse my language, are worse than animals. It's an insult to compare them to animals, because the animals will be insulted. 
I don't want to tell you what kind of abomination they are and their lifestyle and the things they brag about. Do you know what's happening today in public school or in universities? You have to be not normal to even go there for one hour. It's mamash destroying the neshama. A guy from there to your daughter, it's the end of the world. But if a person comes, Ben Torah, serious, wakes up in the morning, how he gets dressed, how he behaves, how he eats, how he makes brachot, how everything is Hashem, Hashem, emunah, confidence in Hashem, pure lifestyle, kosher phone, everything is, you know, protected, filtered, or better not to have it at all, that shows discipline. That's a person that Hashem is proud of. The Gemara say there are three people that Hashem is very proud of. Every day they announce in the court of heaven, pay attention to my son, the hero, the righteous, the tzaddik. Ravak agar bakrach ve'eno chote. A single boy that lives in a large city, meaning lots of women, walks in the street and he watches his eyes. And he doesn't commit any sins, does not pogem babrit. In the court of heaven, they announce your name. Today, Ploni ben Ploni learned all day Torah, watched his eyes, did not watch anything stupid, not even sport. The Yetzer Hara obviously is a genius. He's a great salesman. How a salesman wants to sell you something? First, he has to get you into the store. So they, they put a big sign. There are certain things today you can get for free. So people are curious. They walk in and then they sell them the most expensive thing. That's how the Satan is. If the Satan is going to tell you while you're learning Mara that he wants to show you a horrible, not modest movie from Hollywood, immediately your matzpun, your conscience, is going to beep. Shame on you. After all week you learn your shtag, you're going to go and ruin everything in a minute. So the Satan doesn't come in such a way. So there is playoffs. Playoffs. LeBron against Kerry. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you know what I'm talking about. That's not good. That's not good. So what happened? Ten guys around the screen. Ah, oh, ah, whoo, some crying, some jumping. What's in it for you? Why are you upset? Because you're stupid. Why are you happy? Because you're dumb. <laughs> What's in it for you? Nothing. The Satan pulled you in. And then the commercials, and the women, and the horse, and you know, and then you lose the Olam Abba. <laughs> they make tens of millions of dollars, and you get hurt. Huh? Terrible investment. Rabotai, when Chacham Ovadia was your age, you know, they lived the entire family in one room. But not such a nice big room like this. Not even a quarter of this. There was no homes. <laughs> Today, you come to the houses, Mansi, Lakewood, Flatbush, 13 bedrooms. Each kid is debating which room will I sleep in tonight? This one, the purple one, the yellow one. <laughs> where are you, Moishi? Oh, I stayed in the basement. Next day, where are you? I'm on the top in the attic. It's bored. Back then, there was no such uh, luxury. So Raham Ovadia said when they actually mapped the floor, he would stand on a chair with the Gemara for half an hour. Because <laughs> there's nowhere to hide. They move everything, you know, they move the beds, they move, they wash. So he stand on a chair and learn. Why? <laughs> there's no other place to stand. How many people say, oh great, I have half an hour break. Let me go sit outside, let me go play. Don't get me wrong. When you start, you need some sport to play or certain things or even to go eat something. It relaxes your Yetzirah. Better you put it in there than Chaz Shalom in worse places. But the goal is to get rid of it. Because every minute counts and will not return. Tomorrow night, Erev Lag Baomer, the outside of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. If you ask, Name the top ten people that ever live on earth. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai will be one of them. 
יהיה אב אברהם, יהיה אב יצחק, יהיה אב יעקב, יהיה אב יוסף, יהיה אב דוד, יהיה אב רבי עקיבא, אין יהיה אב רבי שמעון בר יוחאי רשב"י. The level he reached is beyond humanity, beyond what human can reach. 13 years in a cave with angel teaching him all the secrets of life and the Kabbalah and all that, you know. Rashbi is a nitzotz, there's a spark of Moshe Rabbeinu in his neshama. And who was Moshe? Hevel. Hevel, that was murdered by Cain, returned back as Moshe Rabbeinu. Cain came back as Itro, Chetro. But at the same time, Hashem split the soul of Cain into two bodies. One is Itro, and the other one is the Egyptians that Moshe killed. Why? Mida keneged Mida. Cain killed Hevel, Hevel has to kill Cain, but in a kosher way. How you kill someone in a kosher way, there's only one way. That is about to kill a Jew, and you kill him first. Abba leorgecha, shkem leorgo, lo ta'amod al dam recha. So when Moshe killed the Egyptians, vayifen ko vacho, vayar ki en ish, vayach et ha-mitzri, vayach, he said the name of the Lord, and he died. You may think that by now the story is end. The circle is finished. No, it's still going on. Cain murdered Hevel because he was jealous that Hevel has two twins, females, born with him, and he has only one. So now he has to give him a girl. So who is he going to give him? His daughter, Tzipora. So Itro, which is Cain, giving Moshe Rabbeinu, which is Hevel, his daughter, Tzipora, and now I cover what I owe you. That's how the Ari HaKadosh explained. But if that's the case, why Moshe Rabbeinu, parts of his soul came back as Rashbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and what's mutual between Rashbi and Moshe Rabbeinu, both of them reached the highest level of their life, of the history of the world, when they ran away for their life. Moshe ran from Paro after killing the Egyptian, he ran to Midian, that's when Hashem saw him in a burning bush and gave him the mission and sent him to save the Jewish nation. From that moment, Moshe was not the same like until that moment. So, the connection with Hashem happened mainly after he ran away for his life. Same thing Rashbi. Rashbi was together with two Chachamim, Rav Yudah and Rabbi Yossi. And uh, the Gemara brings an interesting story that uh, they started to talk about. Rav Yudah says, uh, how wonderful is what the, what the Romans made, beautiful architecture, uh, nice mikvehs. They upgrading Israel. They have uh, great builders and they, they make Israel look much better. Then Rav Yossi didn't say anything, and Rashbi was zealous to Hashem. He said, everything they do, the wicked people, they do for themselves. In the meantime, there was a person there, Rabbi Yehuda Ben Gerim. He comes from converts. And he heard that, and he went and started to talk about it, until the Romans heard. So when the Romans said, the one that praised us, we will promote him. We'll make him an important chief rabbi. We'll invite him to the inauguration of the king of England. <laughs> That's what they like, this kind of reform rabbis. The one that was quiet will kick him out of town and will go to exile. And the one who dared to criticize us, the Romans, we will have to kill him. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai took his son, Rabbi Al-Azhar, and ran. And he didn't tell his wife to wear. Why? Because they're going to turn her ear, give her a few punches, she's going to have to say where they are. Then he doesn't want her to know. They came to her, where is your husband? Do you think he tells me? He took my son and disappeared. 13 years, they're looking for him. In the cave, he ate carobs and had water there. That's it, carobs and water. Let's see you American boys eating one day carobs. <laughs> Let's see. 
instead of all the American restaurants here and the ice cream, take one carob and try to eat it. It's like eating a piece of wood, it's a little bit sweet. Breaks your teeth. And then two weeks in a bathroom. It's like knives in the stomach, 13 years like this. No clothes, they have to dig themselves in the sand up to here that there will be mother, Tsanua. Imagine this, you have to dig yourself out of the sand. This is the story of Rashbi. Who was this uh, Yehuda Ben Gerim? The same exact story with Moshe and the Egyptian is returning again. Rashbi is Moshe and this one is the same continuation of Cain and the Egyptian and this the same story. Amash again and again and again. It doesn't end. Even today you have three kinds of rabbis. You have rabbis that say the truth, they, they attract fires, they can care less. That's what Hashem say, that's what I have to teach. They butcher you, they hang you, it's not in my hand. Rambam say in Elchot Shuvat, Perek Yud, Allah Habet, a person has to do the mitzvot, not for the reward, not because he's afraid of the punishment, not for Olam Abba, not because he's afraid of Gehenom, because Hashem said so. That's the truth, whether I get something, whether I lose, not, it's not relevant. Vesof atova lavo bichlal. The good will always follow. Why? Because we have a very solid rule. Perfectly logical. What is it? If you sacrifice for the sake of heaven, you're willing to suffer for Hashem, you're willing to fight your desire for Hashem, you're willing to work very hard to make Hashem happy and to listen to His, his uh, instructions. What makes more sense that Hashem will be very happy to reward you for that? Does it make sense that you're going to sacrifice and do so many wonderful things to become better and better for Hashem because the Torah said so? And in the end Hashem will take a knife and stick it in your back? That's what you think about Hashem? Come on. I don't believe that one person here thinks like this way. Because even me, if you would do me a favor, a little tiny favor, I would have great appreciation for you. If tomorrow I see you need help or something, I will be happy to come and pay you back. And I'm sure all of you are the same. This is the principle of life, not to be ungrateful. So if that's the case, I dealt with some Arabs here, workers. I treated them very nice. They like black coffee, no sugar, even though they then, then drink 10 cups of Coke after that. But the coffee, no sugar. I make them uh, wraps, this. Ali, Ahmed, what do you like? They see me like this with a tie. They can't believe it. Wow, this uh, mister is treating us like we are kings. So you have to see how they work. Even when I'm in America, one of them called me and said, you know, there's a leak. You're losing a lot of money on water. What should I do? Make a video call. Why? Appreciation. If tomorrow one of them will be assigned by the Hamas to come to the neighborhood to kill, Jew kill Jews, I am protected 100%. <laughs> he will skip my house for sure. Why? Because before I left, they say, Walla, you are ata achla Yahudi. <laughs> Even the Arabs, that in the way they raise them is kill every Jew. If you treat them like nice, in a nice way, with respect, and you show them appreciation, they pay you back with appreciation. Of course, it's always an exception to the rule, but that's the general rule. So if the Arab has appreciation, what are you saying that Hashem is worse than this Arab? That you're going to sacrifice and sit and learn and become better and get rid of your anger and stinginess and laziness and jealousy and all these bad things and put your heart into the Torah and the mitzvot, and in the end Hashem is going to take a knife and stick it in your back? Come on. So the, the Rambams conclude, Sof atova lavo memeile, bichlal. 
it's one way or the other, <laughs> even if you don't want it, you're gonna get the good. Why? You earned it, it's reality. And if you do bad, you're gonna get the bad, it's reality, it's not even a punishment. If I put a fire here and I put a sign, don't put your hand in, you can lose your hand, and someone did it, he cannot sue me. Hey, I lost my hand because of your fire. No, you lost your hand because you're a fool. Because I told you not to, not to put your hand in, and you put it in. So you can't even say I punished you. You cannot even say I damaged you. Because once I put a warning, and you ignore my warning, everything that happened, it's on you. Same thing when you are Mechalel Shabbat, it's like 12 times in the Torah, that you has Shalom get cut from eternity. It's death by stoning, it's the worst execution, worse than a murderer. A murderer doesn't get such a punishment in the Torah. And then you text on Shabbat and you make phone calls and who knows what else. Ah, you don't believe in Hashem. If you believe in Hashem, you'll dare to be Mechalel Shabbat. Rabotai, when the Torah says Limut Torah keneged kulam, it's literally Limut Torah keneged kulam. Put learning in one side, everything else is not even as great as learning Torah. I want to tell you, you all know what happened in Meron last time when 46 people died in a horrible tragedy. It wasn't the first time that people died in Meron. It happened in the past, in the time of Rabbi Chabab Hatzera, Baba Sali, many years ago. Six, I believe, died there. There was problems there. A few months ago, a boy disappeared there. There's all kinds of midat adib. <laughs> that night, I was asked by Mikdash Melech to give a speech. But they were all booked already to go to Meron. In the morning, I confirmed that I will come to speak at night around 10, 11 at night. Many of the boys that were planning to go to Meron that night, they heard that I'm coming, they canceled the trip. The rabbi said, wow, very good, they're staying here instead of going to Meron. They're gonna stay. I went there, I spoke two hours, we recorded it. Once I finished the lecture, we heard about the tragedy after midnight. I'm thinking to myself, we don't know, but imagine these 20 boys from the yeshiva would go there and Chas Shalom died. Maybe they got their life back just because they prepared, preferred to listen to two hours of Torah with strong words of Musar than to go on a nice trip and have fun. After all, why teenagers go to Meron? Because they are in love with Rashbi? Come on. They are in love with the trip and the barbecue or whatever else they're going to do over there. That's really the truth. If you go a billion times to Meron, a billion times, to lay on a grave of Rashbi and cry and read Tehillim, not for the barbecue and for the trip, for the sake of going to Kivrot Sadikim, will not be equal to one hour you learn here in Yeshiva. No exaggeration. One hour in Shiur Gemara over here, a billion times to Meron cannot reach that level of achievement. Did you ever see Chacham Ben Zion Abba Shaul go there? Chacham Ovadia, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Stipler, Rav Shach, any one of G'dolei Israel goes to Kivrot Tzadikim. If you happen to pass by, why not? I'm here already. Let's read few Pirkei Tehilim. B'schut HaTzadik that is here, Hashem will have mercy on me and give me such and such. Prof, I'm here already, why not? Ignoring the grave is also disrespect. You're next to a grave of a Chacham, you might as well go out 10 minutes, do what you have to do and finish. But to make it a way of life, that's the advice of the Satan. Atzata Satan. Why? The Satan is enjoying that you're going to go every day to Kivrot Tzadikim, as long as you don't sit and learn. Because Kivrot Tzadikim will not turn you into a holy person. But the Torah will turn you into a holy person, to a great davener. Dress like a Jew, not like a Goy. Talk like a Jew, not like a Goy allergic to all the garbage culture of the goyim. It takes time, but it will happen. Kedoshim tiyu ki kadosh ani. What's kadosh? Kadosh means muvdal. Muvdal, meaning separated from the nations. As long as you love what they do and what they enjoy from, that means the goyish negativity in you is still not out. It's the venom of the snake, the poison. So Rabotai, 
I know what, you, what I'm saying to you, some of you may be thinking, eh, I'm not in this level, what is he talking about? If, oh, maybe it will take me years to be in this level. Okay, fair enough. But if you don't know the truth, how are you going to aim to get there? If you think, oh, I'm great, I'm here, I'm learning a little bit, I'm showing up sometimes to Daven, I walk in the street of Jerusalem, having fun, playing basketball, and I'm great. No, no, it's not enough. It's not enough for Hashem. It demands a lot more from you. Every one of you is a son of God. The Christians, two billion of them worship one Jew that was kicked out of yeshiva <laughs> and he's the son of God. <laughs> there was one rabbi in Luzan, Rav Berkovich. He was also a chazan. He, he had a, an amazing sense of humor. So he asked one time, he came on December 24th. You know how the Goim walk half a day? So how did he first get a visa to enter Switzerland? Lausanne, it's in Switzerland. It's the hardest place to become citizen. The hardest. So when he had a committee, they asked him, the Goim, Rabbi Berkowitz, give us a reason why we should approve your citizenship and give you a Swiss passport. So listen to what he told them. He told them, let me ask you, all of you waiting for the day that JC would come and save you all, right? When he will finally show up in Lausanne one day, he's going to start talking and speaking in Hebrew. None of you will know what he wants from you. That's when I'm going to save you. <laughs> You're going to need me to tell you what he says. They started to laugh, you know, to make a French Swiss people laugh. It's a very hard mission. <laughs> they all laugh. <laughs> Stamp the, the papers. Approve. He got into Lausanne. Now he's in the office with the goyim. He comes to a goy. He says to him, tonight, it's the most happy, the happiest night for me in life. <laughs> the goyim celebrate Christmas. The goy asked him, why? It's a Christian holiday, not a Jewish holiday. So exactly. How many times a year two billion Christians bow down to one Jew? <laughs> <laughs> On December 26, that guy came to him and said, Rabbi, you ruined my entire Christmas. <laughs> I went to the church and I'm thinking to myself, I'm worshipping a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> he also said, what's worse, to be a rabbi or a chazan? What's worse? He said, to be a rabbi is worse. Why? When you chazan, everyone falls asleep behind your back. <laughs> when you're a rabbi, everyone sleeps in your face. It's very insulting. You know, one rabbi came to a place and he saw a guy falling asleep. He asked his friend, can you wake him up? He said, no, no. You put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> So he had a lot of good jokes. In the end, the most important thing, he has a lot of Torah. Lots of beautiful Ashkafa and Musar. Abotai, I want to say that right here in the room, a few months ago when I was here, if you would like to be the perfect Jews, perfect, that Hashem will mark V next to every field of your life, I'm giving you a great tip. Yeshiva is very important, Gemara is very important, everything you're going to do is very important. There's one thing that will always send you to the right direction. What is it? Read all the books of Rabbi Avigdor Miller, Zatzal. If you read his books, you won't need thousand speeches I give you here, it will not be one of his books. Because that was a very holy man. A real servant of Hashem, Kohen, Tzaddik, Yeresh Shamaim, and the most important thing, the biggest rabbi in the world in Ashkafa. The biggest is Ashkafa is better than perfect. If you want to know what Hashem thinks, what Hashem likes, what Hashem hates, what Hashem thinks about every topic of your life to today's world, you're going to find the answer in his book. Follow it. Make it your guideline. I say that in my lectures, goim, 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 goim. Not Bachurei Shiva, Jews. Goim started to buy his books. 
They became a hundred percent בחורי ישיבה עם דר השקפה. You have to see how they talk. You have to read the rimes, you won't believe, it's not a Jew. Their Ashkafa became better than a lot of these modern people who go with the small yamakas out there. That's going to give you a lot of strength. Because you know, finally, there's no hypocrisy. It's 100% the truth, regardless. There's no politics. I can care less, Rabbi Vigdom, you can care less what people say, not say, that's the truth. We don't move an inch from it. If you get yourself to this level, everything in your life will work out. Everything in your life. There was one rabbi, Alav Shalom, Rav Moshe Malka Zatzal. Rav Moshe Malka used to go to some place which he had a nice room and a private mikveh. And people come, stand on line to give him checks. He had yeshiva, 700 boys in Nebrak. Very, very holy person. So... One time he saw something that was uh, terrible in that community over there. And he tried to warn the person where he stay. The person didn't care. And he said, I will never ever step here ever again. What about all the money? What about all the checks? It took you 30 years to establish yourself over here. I'm not coming here ever again. What happened? He needs to start from zero. Ha, where did Hashem send him? To Bnei Yosef. <laughs> Brooklyn. With all the Halabim, all the rich people come in and out. They started to see this holy man, how he died three hours with crying every day, every tefillah. Yes. Begin to shake when you see his holiness. His emunah in Hashem, his ashkafa. He was a sharp knife. What he was getting over there, he got 10 times more over there. Why? Because he can never ever lose from sticking to the truth. He cannot lose from not watching dirty things on your phone. You cannot lose from blocking the phone from horrible things who destroys the neshama. You cannot lose from sitting learning Torah while other people go to play or to do other things. He cannot lose. In the long run, it will pay off. This is what you have to talk to yourself every day. I can never lose from following the truth of Hashem. Some of you think, you know, I have plans, I'm going to finish yeshiva, I'll go to university, you know, all these things. Maybe you don't really know what's happening there, but I get reports from there, from people who are already there, what they have to go through. If you think that Parnassah comes from the university, that's heresy. That's kfirah. Bnei Israel did not go to any university and didn't have any degree. And they had enough to eat. And they were all wealthy. All the wealth of the Egyptians came to them. Four years in the desert, bread is falling, everything is ready to be made. Mamash. Do you really think Hashem needs you to sit with the goyim and the goyot and all the lack of modesty and the worst terrible curses that they speak all day and the avodah zara and the antisemitism and who knows what all the heresy they teach over there in order for you to make a hundred thousand dollars a year? You really think Hashem needs it? So now you're thinking, well, if I'm not going to do it, what will I do? What your grandparents did when they came from Syria? They knew English? They uh, went to university? No. They came from Halab, Damascus, the Bukharians from Uzbekistan, the Persian from Iran. They didn't know anything. Every one of them is also almost a multi-millionaire. The less educated they are, the wealthier they are. Check. I remember in my days in the banking, I went to Flatbush Avenue to sign up a Syrian guy that had a sneaker store and a leather jacket. The store was bigger than this bed midrash by double. He had more than a million dollar merchandise hanging there. And when I had to sign him up on the agreement, the agreement, one copy goes to him, one copy to me, one copy to the bank. So when you sign, it goes to all the copies. <laughs> he took out the box. He put his thumb on the ink, and I said, that's it, I sign. I said, come on, what's this? You have to sign your name in English, print your name, date. 
I'm, I don't know English. He has 20 sneaker stores like this. And he did not learn how to sign his name in English. Make sense? No. Of course it makes sense. Because Parnassah has nothing to do with your education because King Solomon already wrote. Lo lachachamim lechem. The stipler said, I cannot promise every Avrech that will learn Torah all his life to be wealthy. But I definitely promise to everyone that's supposed to be wealthy that because of the Torah he will not lose a penny from his wealth. Did you understand what he said or no? Not everyone is meant to be rich. Even in a secular world, not everyone is a millionaire. No. Some people need to be rich, some need to be poor, some need to be average. But if you decided to learn Torah and not to go to waste time in all those places and kill yourself in business, if Hashem brought you to the world in order for you to be wealthy, you must be wealthy. There's one Hasid in Monsi, he got married, he doesn't speak a word in English or in Hebrew, just Yiddish. And he was very naive. What does he know about business? After his wedding, he had $27,000 in gifts. One shark, snake, crook from real estate realized that this guy is ignorant. He doesn't know anything from his life. It's an opportunity to get his money out of him. He came to him, who's Master Mendel, Alice Git? He said, uh, there's a great investment. You're probably looking where to invest your gift money, no? <laughs> what are you doing with the money you made? We're using it. No, in a few months you're not going to have anything left. So what do you suggest? There is a land in upstate New York. 20 acres. I can get it for you for 27,000. At 130, I'll talk them down. 27, you can close the deal. And he said to him, but what, what will I do with this? He said, yeah, one day we'll be worth millions. If you have a chance to be rich, that's your chance. This naive guy, okay, well, I trust you. <laughs> 20 acres with trees, big, huge trees, rocks, no sewer, no electric, nothing. In the middle of nowhere, in upstate. Gave him the money. His parents said, what did you do? I bought 20 acres of land. You're out of your mind. It's not worth two dollars. Do you know how many millions it's going to cost to cut off the trees and pull them out and make it straight, move all the rocks, make sewer? Ah, the city will never make anything there. It's much like burning the money. What can I do? That's what Hashem wanted, that I lose my money. I should have asked before. Two years later, he get a phone call, Mendel, yes. Are you the owner of the lot over there in upstairs? Upstairs? He already forgot about it. Yeah, yeah, it's me. <laughs> Barely speak English. <coughs> we own a camp, and we would like to extend the camp by 10 more acres, and there's not enough room. So you own the lot, we would like to buy it from you. This time he learned his lesson. <laughs> he got a good lawyer, got $3 million for the land. Wow. Why? Because Hashem wanted this ignorant Hasid that only knows how to learn and daven to make three million dollars, that's it. Rabotai, you have to believe it because that's the truth. And if Hashem writes in the Torah, I gave you houses that you did not build, full of all the wealth that you did not fulfill, wells that you did not dig, gold and silver that you did not earn, all you have to do, eat, make bracha, don't be ungrateful. Trust me, Parnassa is 100% for me. 100%. That's why you don't need to kill yourself. And you definitely, definitely don't need to make money by going in a crooked way. By committing sins every day for three, four, five years in a university full of goyim and Nazis. That will force you to be like a guy because you'll be embarrassed in front of them to do what you need to do as a Jew or bring you down. Rabotai, it's not, uh, it's not just a recommendation. It's a matter of eternity. 
Chas v'shalom, some people lost their eternity because of this. And some people got saved for eternity. 100%. Any questions before we finish? Baruch Hashem, all of you are shocked, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> so that's already a good sign. Yeah, please. Uh, what do you think is the, uh, is the best way, whenever you go back, to hold and, and, not, and, not, and not to fall? Or at least try best to not fall to all of the Gashmud and everything like the air. We live in such like a dirty place in New York and everywhere we come from. The only way to get safe from what these worlds offer is to be always connected deeply into Torah learning. If you leave the Torah even few days, immediately you fall. That's what it says. Im ta'azveni yom, yomayim e'ezveka. If you're going to leave my Torah for one day, you will feel my absence in your life for two days. Rav Ben Zion, Abba Shaul Zatzal, one time in his speech say, Im ta'azveni yom, yomayim, kama e'ezveka, God forbid. Change the order, of course, that was just to wake up the people. The, the literal explanation, if if you leave me one day, I'll leave you for two. But Rav Ben Sion said, if you leave me for a day or two, I would leave you. For who knows how long. So remember, it's all Mida Keneged Mida. If you're connected to Torah, 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 even when you're in a car, you listen to a good drasha, alachot, something to inspire. You're in yeshiva, whatever you do, it can never ever be that you're going to lose from it. Not in your health, not in your parnasa, not in the quality of wife you're gonna get, not in the kind of children you're going to have. Impossible. The Torah and the sacrifice and not going to horrible places such as universities and other places of kfirah will benefit your neshama and your body. Guarantee. It may take time, you may have challenges, people make fun at you maybe, maybe the family will put pressure on you. We've been in this film, we know how it works. In the long run, nobody ever lost. Nobody ever lost. Some people become big rabbis. Some rabbis are very rich. They made a list here in Israel of the 10 richest rabbis. There's one rabbi that has 1.4 billion shekel in his bank account available. <laughs> what does he do? Avrech. Avrech. Yoshev Elomed. Imagine how many infatuations he has. Let me do this, let me sit and learn. There's many others. The Torah is their life. Yes. Um. A lot of times we hear from the boys that uh, the parents are very against them coming back for a second year for another's man, and uh, they have a very big challenge how to deal with the parents. And if you want to know some maybe some advice from the rabbi? How should one talk to his parents if he really wants to come back next year when they're against them? I tell you from experience that American kids are the best in getting everything they want from their parents. <laughs> so if they really want to come, it will take 10 minutes to convince their parents. Just like they did a million times before. The only difference is that maybe they, took, they take the parents' pressure as an excuse not to come back because they themselves have yet Sarara not to come back. But if they decide to come back, they'll manage with their parents. They will. You know, I had a woman, she told me I'm Shomer Shabbat for three years. And my husband refused to be Shomer Shabbat. I told her, it's your fault. My fault. I'm coming to cry to you and I'm begging him to be Shomer Shabbat. I said, it's your fault 100%. Everything you need from your husband, you know how to get. <laughs> if you wanted him to keep Shabbat, he would keep Shabbat. No, but I'm talking to him, I'm begging him, I'm asking, I even cried once. Oh, only once. That's the problem. Next time he's about to start his car and get out of the driveway, lay down on the driveway behind the car. So you want to get out of the house in Shabbat, on Shabbat, you have to go to drive over my body. He's going to try to pull you off, scream, cry, make a scene in the neighborhood. 
I'm embarrassed. I said, well, you want to save the neshama of your husband? Get 10 minutes embarrassment. So what? Scream! No, Hashem, help! After that, he won't ever do it again. <laughs> he will see that it's really important for you. And believe it or not, she did it. And right away, she said, that's it, Baruch Hashem. It was, I didn't have to be that dramatic. As soon as I say, you know what, if you leave, I'm going to lay down on the floor. Okay, okay, calm down. Finish. Shomer <laughs> Shabbat. So, you tell your parents, listen, you want me to be happy or you want me to be depressed? I'm happy. I'm learning Torah. I, I'm building myself. I'm curing all my problems, my trauma from the past, my abuse from the past. The Torah heals everything. They'll get along with that. And then you don't have to tell them you go for another year. You tell them three more months, and then two more months, and then three more months until you be 60. <laughs> That's how I speak more than three hours every Tuesday in Flatbush. How do you think people see three and a half hours in my speeches? Sit like this, three and a half hours. Every half an hour I say, okay, the last thing for today and we'll be done. So they get straight. <laughs> oh, oh, finally, 10 more minutes. <laughs> and then I speak another 50 minutes. Okay, one little tiny thing, and we're done. Another 50 minutes. So sometimes they already laugh. <laughs> but it works on the head. Little, little more, little more, little more, little more. And they live with that. Yes, yes. Who comes first, your parents or Hashem? Hashem. Okay. Now let's read a bit. It's mitzvah to respect the parents in everything, except when they tell you, commend you, or advise you to do anything against Hashem's will. That's the rule. Now between me and you, you're a clever guy. If we would call Hashem right now here to Lev Aaron to speak to every one of us. And every one of you, Hashem, I want to go to a college full of goyot, full of goyim who curse every other word and smoke grass and play all kinds of horrible music. And it's a mamash a prostitution place. <laughs> and order for me one day to be a pharmacist. Do you really think Hashem will get along with the plan? or he will be extremely petrified just from the option. So we know the truth, so who are we lying to? You need me to tell you the truth, you cannot figure it out yourself. You see, in the 70s, university were not as bad as now. There was no heresy there, lots of them were Christians, so Christian, you know, they don't teach about you know, abomination, it's allowed, and liberalism, and the rest of the garbage that they teach today. It wasn't as bad. And the women were more modest, and people had more dignity. So it wasn't as critical. Today, it's mamash pikuach nefesh of the neshama. No, no doubt whatsoever, pikuach nefesh. Every person that goes to college destroys the neshama with no exception to the rule. Guarantee. Even if you're the biggest matmid and you finish the shas. Two months over there with the goyim and you see how you look. One of the ways, you have to focus very much on how you dress. Don't walk on the street with shorts, with all kinds of uh, goy shirts, t-shirts. Pay attention to how you dress. You represent the Kadosh Baruch Hu on the street. Don't dress like an Arab worker over here. And that's not what Hashem wants. Hashem wants you to be Ben Torah. Tzitzit, you put, your, put it out, put it out. You want to put it in, put it in. Tzitzit, white shirt, when you dive in jacket, hat. Even though hat, between you and me, what, what's a hat? It's not, uh, but the world accepted it. You and I can think it's stupid, it doesn't matter, it's not relevant. I surrender my Yetzirah to this stupid hat every day. <laughs> Especially someone like me who boils. And that, that just makes me sweat nonstop. But everyone wear it, I cancel my own opinion. Lo poresh minat sibur. People daven with hats and jackets, do the same. You'll be shocked how much it will help you from inside to change. The external appearance change the internal appearance. When you come with slippers and you know, to davening like this, you're doing a favor, you showed up, your davening look, you know how. But you come serious and you dress serious, 
and the davening is big deal for you, everything you talk to Hashem express goes, because the Hashem is going to be so impressed by the way you are. Because remember, Hashem knows you, how difficult it is for you. He knows from your culture, from where you come from, from the community. Some of you probably were sitting on a beach on Deal a few years ago over there, Hashem Yerachem. <laughs> and now, Baruch Hashem, you came to a holy place. And uh, Hashem is very impressed. But if you do it, why not to do it in a perfect way? Why not? Why 70%? Why 60%? You're already here. Do it 100% right. Show Hashem here, I'm getting rid of the stupid hair. I'm going to get rid of the stupid clothing. I'm going to put filter on my phone. I won't do chas v'shalom something to upset you. And while I'm learning, I'm going to make notes. I'm going to record. I'm going to go over it. I won't waste time. And definitely won't go to places here in Yerushalayim where all the chilonim there. Because that's not, definitely not going to help. More questions? Over there, yes. Yeah, um, if a person needs to go into work, right, whatever it is, whatever the case may be, what's considered a How many hours a day? That's a very good question. Everybody asks this question, basically. How much ishtadlut have to make, how much efforts have to make to make a living? The answer, it's a mathematical formula. This is how it works. The more you count on Hashem and have confidence in Him, the less efforts you have to put in making money. Now you may ask, but how do I know to rate myself from zero to a hundred? How do I know what percentage I am in confidence in Hashem? So the answer is, if you worry about the future, you worry, how will I get married? How will I buy a house? How will I buy a ring to my future wife? How will I buy a car? How will I support children? How, how, how? That means you have almost zero emunah in Hashem. Zero confidence in Hashem. So what's the solution? Chuvot alevavot. There's a lot of great books about confidence in Hashem and emunah, and you have plenty of them in English as well. I have maybe 15 good lectures about it. That once you listen to them, it will give you a huge boost to be strong and count on Hashem 100% and the miracles will begin. But if you are afraid, you have to make a lot of efforts. You actually determine if you will be free or you'll be a slave. It's in your hand 100%. And I'll give you a mashal, you get it. One poor man did not eat for two days. He's about to faint. He's looking now for someone to give him food. He saw a nice mansion with a big mezuzah. He knocked on the door. The rich man opened the door. Can you feed me? I'm dying. I will give you a meal that you never saw in your life. But I'm a businessman. I give nothing for free. I need you to work for me two, three hours and I'll give you the meal. You can eat as much as you want. What do I have to do? Clean my garage. Take everything from the shelves. Clean the dust. Put everything on. Two, three hours and you're done. The poor man say, before I'll die, I might as well do it. Who knows if someone else will give me food. He cleans everything, put everything back. He comes back to the rich man. Here, I finish. He looks around. Wow, you did a good job. Tov. You see the house across the street? Open the door and the meal is waiting for you. The poor man is thinking, maybe he's a crook. As soon as I woke up, he locked the door. <laughs> I work for nothing. <laughs> what can he do? He goes quickly across the street. Open the door. Did he find food or no? No. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable food. Soups, meat, fish, desserts, fruits, vegetables. Enough for 20 people. Quickly he eats, eats, eats. Two days in eat. Puts in his pocket. Put under his keeper. Everywhere in his underarm. He has to leave now, but he tried to grab as much as he can. Just when he's about to leave, there was someone upstairs watching him the entire time. He didn't see. He said to him, you know, I've seen a lot of ungrateful people in my life, but someone like you, i never seen. Why? You ain't here for an hour, and you're about to leave without saying thank you? Tell me, you're doing me any favor? I walk like a slave three hours for this meal. You walk for three hours? Who knows you? It's the first time I see you. 
So I walked across the street. Ah, the crook. The crook took advantage on you. We have nothing to do with him. This is Betam Khoi. We feed poor people for free every day. Wow. wow. So you mean I could have just walked in and eat and without walking? Yeah, he took advantage on you. That's the mashal, the parable. What's the nimshal? The poor person is every one of us. The rich one across the street is the Satan, the Yetzir Hara. The place where the food was ready, it's the world. And the one upstairs is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now let's re-understand the story. A person thinking, I'm hungry. I need parnasa. How will I have money? Immediately the Satan shows up, the rich man from the story. You have to work. If you don't work, how are you going to survive? Okay, I work. Here you go. Three hours work and you make money. So you go and work. And then you come, you get, you know, your parnasa. And then Hashem say to you, what? You don't even say thank you that I'm giving you this parnasa. When I work very hard for it. Because you're a fool. Who told you to work? You will get from me anyway. All you have to do is to trust me and have confidence that I feed you. That's it. Once you have this confidence, you don't ever have to worry. You know the Chazonish? The Chazonish has a, had a rule in his life. He always try once and one more time. That's it. If you try something and then work out. Let's say he wants to meet, I don't know, a rich guy to, to give money to the yeshiva or whatever. The rich guy didn't show up. He will try maximum second time. If second time did not work, he will never try for the third time. Why? Hashem knows. I try once. Okay. Second time, if it didn't work, I'm never going to try a third time. One person told me, that's very foolish. I'm a salesman. Do you know how many times I have to beg the customer until in the end he surrender and he buys the, the loan? I sign him up. At least 10 times I drive him crazy. Look how many texts, backs and forth. He's cursing me, throwing me out, threatening me. Don't ever dare to call me. A month later I come back. In the end I sign him up. If I was with the Chazonish, I would not close one deal in cash advance. <laughs> <laughs> one deal. So who's right, the guy or the Chazonish? The guy has a point. After 10 times, he's a real nudnik, a real pest. And he signed him up after 10 times. Based on the rule of two times, he would never sign a deal. So who's right? If I ask who is right, the Chazonish or anyone in the world, you're right, always the Chazonish. Now tell me what is it about? First, the Chazonish is right. It's Malach Hashem Tzvahot. But the question is, let's try to understand why he's right. The answer is like this. When you are low in confidence, your level is very low, Hashem lets you eat what you cook for yourself. You have zero emuna, zero confidence, be a slave. Try again, and again, and again, and again. It's a punishment because you're a loser. But if you know everything is for me, one time you tried, after the second time, you got the point. Shame if you wanted it to be mine, it would be mine. I tried once, maximum second time. Didn't work out. That means for the next time when Hashem wants you to have something, He knows He has to perform in maximum two attempts. He won't have a third chance. So if Hashem wants you to have something, He can give it to you first shot, maximum second shot. But if you know, if He knows you, you have low confidence, and you mamash believe in your efforts, he puts you in the hand of your stupidity. Bederech she'adam rotze lilech, molichim oto. You want to be a slave? You'll be a slave. You want to make your money through academic education? You go and you do it there. On the expense of losing your olam haba and your neshama. So, isn't it a shame? Imagine a person come after seven years of working as a doctor. 
And Hashem said to him, you made $30 million profit as a doctor. Very nice. What about if I tell you you would make just as much if you would sit and learn Torah all your life? How? How? Avrech makes uh, half a million dollar a year? You don't trust me that I have my ways? How, how many... How much money people can make in a way you never believe? You walk in the street, a car hit your leg. <laughs> Hashem paid you for something that you did uh, two years ago, walking with your legs to Ben Yehuda Street. <laughs> two years later, the punishment came. So now you walk, you know, <laughs> oh, I'm suffering, I can't walk up, help me out. You know, you have three, four months of suffering. Huh? 1.5 million insurance money. <laughs> You put it in a bank, 5% interest on one, on one and a half million. You have a beautiful income. While well, you sit and learn Torah every day, 500, 700, 1,000. It's revolving. <laughs> it's growing. <laughs> growing. There's many ways to make money, Rabotai. <laughs> one guy came to get married. And he, you know, he has nothing. So he came to the future in-laws. They want to interview him. So what are you going to do after you get married to my daughter? Nothing. I want to learn Torah. Okay, everyone wants to learn Torah. I also learned Dafyomi. <laughs> but Parnasa! You don't want to teach. Maybe you want to do tzitziot, like here, like the guy over there. He's making tzitziot. Maybe you make some money out of it. Maybe you'll be a sofer, you write Sifre Torah, Mezuzot. Make Parnassah, no? No. I want to learn Torah and teach Torah. So how are you going to buy a car? Hashem Yazor. How are you going to buy my daughter a ring? Hashem Yazor. How are you going to have money for the rent at least? Hashem Yazor. He said to his wife, Sarah, I didn't know my name is Hashem. <laughs> Hashem Yazor. <laughs> But that was a joke, but this joke actually happened in reality. <laughs> Next to where I live in Monsi, there's a big Ashkenazi tzaddik, Talmid Chacham, tzaddik yesod olam. Eved Hashem, like in the books. You know how you read in the books about the tzaddikim? Baruch Hashem, we still have. Lo Alman Israel. When he was young, they set him up with a shiduch. He was mamash ben Torah amiti. Everybody knew it's going to be a big rav one day. So those Talmidei Chachamim, they usually get the daughter of the Gvir. So the Gvir asked him, what are you going to do for a living? He said, I want to teach and learn Torah all my life. Nothing else. You don't want to do this. You don't want... No, 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 nothing. Just Torah, Torah, all my life. The next day, he, the Gvir comes to his friend, another Gvir. You're not going to believe this chutzpah guy. I ask him, what are you going to do for a living? Of course, we're going to help, we're going to give a lot of money. But don't you want to do something yourself? He said, no, I only want to learn and teach. Can you believe it? He's not even telling me. Yeah, of course, I'm going to try, I'm going to make some efforts. Nothing. In my face. You pay all my bills. <laughs> So the Gvir, the other one, said, who is this Chatzuf? Who has such chutzpah in these days? What's his name? His name is such and such. Right the way the other Gvir ran. Where is he? You, you, come here. I also have a daughter. <laughs> if you like her, everything you ask from the other guy, I give you double. <laughs> Never have to worry about money. <laughs> when they did that, got married. Unbelievable family. Not only is a huge Talmud Chacham that hundreds of people walk an hour with their strymel in 95 degrees, 100% humidity to hear him on Shabbos. Every morning, 20 people waiting on line next to his room to get checks. Kol am kayem Torah me'oni, sofo lekayma me'osher. Kolam kayem Torah me'oni. Now, now, Rabotai, I'm going to tell you a story and we finish here. I know some of you, some of you will not take off their long hair for any amount of money. You're not alone. I know the hair is a big yetzer 
But you don't know that the sitra achra, the satan, the judgment in your life is because of the hair. The Zohar says horrible things about men with long hair. I don't want to scare you too much. But I'm going to tell you a story. I used to give a speech every Monday night in Brooklyn, in Flatbush, in the Israeli house. It was sponsored by Volson, the Volson family. Everyone who comes to New York and wants to live somewhere for free, with food, refrigerator, beds, everything, three floors, private home. You can live for free in one condition. You have to attend the night shiur from 8 to 10. That's it. You can do whatever you want, go to work, make money. 8 to 10, you have to participate in a shiur. And every night is a different rabbi. Monday night was me. Now every Monday I come, there's new faces. Some of them were already sent to the yeshiva. That was the whole thing. Two or three lectures, send them to Monsi. Baruch Hashem, they become Bnei Torah. I come to the place, I see two Israeli guys. One with Afro like this, Oren. Oren Suisa. And the other one, long hair in the back, like this, very long. I see long hair, it's like a radar. Tu, 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 tu. <laughs> right. I said, tonight we're going to speak about long hair for men. <laughs> right away. Remember, there are two, three days there. Chilonim legamre, complete secular. I begin to speak from 8 o'clock. They have to stand until 10 to stay. 10 they can get up and leave. Rabotai, three hours, it's 11 already. Fighting, arguing. Talk to us about this, talk to us. Why nafalta alenu ala hair, ala hair? I said, I gotta get these guys together, I have a haircut. 11 o'clock at night, I <laughs> look at the door. Who walks in? The most famous barber in Brooklyn, Gil Nachman. <laughs> King's Highway is a barber shop, Gil and uh, Lior. Everybody takes haircut by them, all the young guys, professional. He walks in with haircut machine and scissors, he's holding him in his hand. Hi, Rabbi. Manish Magili, what are you doing here at 11 o'clock? I heard you give a lecture here, I came to say hi. I said, but why are you having this haircut machine and this at 11 o'clock at night in your hands? He said, once I close the shop, I go to people's homes to give them haircut in the house. That's big money. They cannot come during the day. You know, the rich people. They ask you to come to the house to, have, to give them haircut. So I was just giving someone a haircut here, one block away, and he told me that he's speaking here. I look at these two guys, I say, in the 11 o'clock at night, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent you the best barber in Brooklyn, ready, with the tools, after three hours, and you're not going to take a haircut? They look at each other, it's achi. It's not possible to be a miracle, it cannot be a coincidence. Rabotai, two complete chilonim, what do they know about Ashgacha? But even they got the points. Achi, it's not possible to be a miracle, it cannot be a coincidence. So, okay, now this guy, oh, you know how many years it took me to grow this hair. He went into the shower, Rabotai said, Gili, don't do everything. As I'm speaking to the other guy, Yossi, I hear from the shower, No! Like this, for 20 seconds. I got scared. The guy came out, How did I agree? His head became like a tennis ball. <laughs> it was like a water, man. It became a tennis ball. So, oh my God. I said to the other guy, Allah, your turn. <laughs> As I finished with the both of them took haircuts. This guy, wow, it took me years. You have to see how he cried for the hair. <sighs> then I said to the other guy, Yossi, I want you to come to the yeshiva. Come for a few days, see how it is. No, oh, I'm working in Eagle Bakery in Borough Park. I work there, I have to be there in the morning. He said, don't worry, I know you're Eagle, the owner. First thing in the morning, I call him, I tell him I kidnap you to the yeshiva. He will be very happy. No, but I have other things to do. I'm not ready to come to yeshiva. I'll come Sunday. Now remember, it's Monday night. 
I say to him, by Sunday you won't remember what took place here. If you don't make a decision now, nothing will happen in six days. No, no, I give you my word. Sunday I will come. I ask him, how much money do you have in your wallet? He said, why? He said, check. He opened the wallet, $200. This was almost 20 years ago. $200 was like 600 today. $200! I say, give me the money as collateral, security. If you show up on Sunday, as soon as you walk into the yeshiva, I hand you the $200. If you don't come, I put it in the tzlaka box of the yeshiva. He said, wow, I worked three, three days for this $200 in a bakery. Three days. By the oven, in the heat. I said, what do you care? You promised that you're coming anyway, no? No, the, your money is secure. Don't worry. <laughs> he gave me the money. Sunday, I sit in yeshiva, 9, 10, 11, 1 o'clock, lunch break. Me and my chevruta were still there. 1.30, both of them walks in with the bags. Yeah. Right away, I got up quickly. I took the $200. I said, Call a cavod here. <laughs> he looks at me. He said, Lava <laughs> You know why I'm here? For this $200. I slept three days for that. <laughs> Rabotai, they sat in yeshiva for a few months. Two extraordinary sharp brains like this you don't find. Unbelievable. After a few months, the rabbi say, you deserve to go to one of the best yeshivot in Israel. Send them to Kaf Chaim, Rav Sofer here in Bukhari, in Nerbohud here. They became big Talmidei Chachamim. I forgot about them. Years went by. Two or three years ago, I got to give a speech in Kiryat Motzkin. In Haifa over there. 500 people in the audience. There's a big stage. I'm on the stage. And I tell the audience the story. As I tell them the story, I see one guy with a black hat. He picked up his head. I said, wow, that's the guy with the afro. <laughs> 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 I can't believe he's here. <laughs> what are the odds? I said, Rabotai, you're not going to believe what just happened. What? The guy with the tennis ball <laughs> is right here. If he would agree to come to the stage, that would be wonderful. Right the way he got up. You have it on, on video. This, you have to see this. He got up on the stage, everyone clapped. I say to him, no, as a Yofi, Ben Torah, Yalla, give them as a speech. 25 minutes he spoke. You know Rav Meir Eliyahu? Like a machine gun. Maybe 200 sources. This, Gemara, this, Rashi, Rambo. I got my head spinning. I see 500 people. Rabotai, ra'item ma hu haya, ma hu niya? Look at what the Torah did. And the other guy, both of them are big rabbis. Tov! Few more months went by, a year or two. My son learned over here in Esha Talmud, in Givat Shaul. My son called me up, Abba, remember the guy from the story with the hair? By any chance his name was Oren Suisa? I said, yes. He said, his son is my roommate in yeshiva. Wow. No, Hashem runs the world or no? The reason I told you this story as the last thing for today, I want you to understand, these two guys, if they would not cut their hair that night, when it was a moment of et ratzon, who knows bichlal if today there will be Shomer Shabbos. Maybe a week later they would leave the place. Who, who knows, maybe Chaz they will be married to Goyot bichlal. That's what Chazal say, Yes, Adam kone olamo berega echad. Sometimes your entire life can take a twist to the right direction in a moment. And if Hashem brought you over here, that's what He expects every one of you to become Bnei Torah, Tzadikim, Talmidei Chachamim, that in 20 years from now, you be the rabbis of the community. And you're going to have your own shuls. And you will teach Torah to thousands. And you will have millions of views. And someone will come and remind you where, where you came from, from Lev Aaron. And that's when you remember, wow, it could have been the other way around. That you lived 